One word, actually two words specifically. People love to throw around the word vortex. I don't remember how many. I spent all these debating people on uh, energy forums. People love to use the word polarity and vortex all the time. And it's like, oh, just go ahead and define that term polarity for me. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got two poles. Well, you just made a description, but that's not an explanation. Descriptions are never explanations. That's the difference between someone that repeats crap that they read or were taught to believe and someone that actually has a discriminating mind that actually knows how to think. It's like, well, just go ahead. You love to use this term polarity. Why don't you define it for us? Ah, uh, yeah. A magnet doesn't have poles, for example. Sure it does. You know, I got a pole finder. I got lots of pole finders for magnets. I got more magnets than anybody you'll ever meet, except for someone that sells magnets. Um, <laughs> a magnet doesn't have poles, for example. The incommensurability, the non-point specific field incommensurability within a magnet. For example, if a magnet could be sliced like a loaf of bread. Well, here's the North Pole and the South Pole. You place the magnetic viewing film over top of a magnet, and here you see there's a, that's the midpoint. So, well, go ahead and slice it right down the middle. Of course, it's kind of hard to slice a ceramic neodymium iron boron or a samarium cobalt or a ferrite magnet, but if you could, you would find that each new section has two poles. There's, there's no such thing as dividing the poles up of a magnet it is point nonspecific. It is like a holographic paradigm. Within each and every part, you will find an identical yet smaller image of the whole. Here we get into holism, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of the term holism before. If not, you should probably look it up. But a magnet does not have poles. To define polarity, we actually have to understand what a force vector is and why a magnetic field is toroidal. Now, the conjugate geometry of nature, and this is the immutable principle of the entire universe, this conjugate principle of force and motion, inertia and acceleration, the mirror image of the toroidal is the hyperboloidal. And the hyperboloid is an hourglass shape, you know, two, two bell ends. And, of course, the negative image of, a, of, a, of that is a toroid. They're both mirror images of one another. One is... Uh, the uh, geometry of force and motion, i.e. magnetism, centrifugal divergence. The other one is the geometry of increasing inertia and acceleration, i.e. the electrostatic or dielectricity. A magnet does not have poles, nor do people understand what polarity is. When we talk about polarity, let's draw a pole. Let's like we draw a line on a two-dimensional line on a chalkboard. Here we go. That's, a, that's polarity. Uh, no, it's, that's not. You, you just drew a line. And Mother Nature doesn't draw a line like this. Point A to point B, that's a line. Okay? And this is one end of the pole, and that's the other end of the pole. No, Mother Nature's line, first off, is not two-dimensional. And it starts off like this. From a null point in counter space, the release of energy, electrostatic, i.e. dielectricity, the release of that energy, which, by the way, that equation for the release of energy or the extrinsic principle of the dielectric or electrostatic, i.e. the agathon or the absolute, is tattooed right here on the inside of my inner wrist, which is my discovery, by the way. Mother Nature's line is like this. Not like a human line. Point A, point B, we're going to draw a line. You set your pencil on the paper, and then you draw a line. That's two-dimensional, and that's not Mother Nature's line. To define polarity, we actually have to think correctly. Polarity cannot. This is a three-dimensional universe, right? Everything that defines a three-dimensional universe is based upon magnetism. Of course, the universe only has magnitude and volume due to magnetism and magnetism only. So, the force vector that defines polarity and paints out or extrapolates out the hypertrochoidal uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the toroidal, pardon me, the toroidal uh, geometry of, uh, of magnetism is Mother Nature's line from a null point in counter space like this. Not like this or this, but from counter space like that. Okay, well, that's merely two-dimensional. Mother Nature's line is like this, so we actually have to draw a correct force vector, and that would be a three-dimensional S-curve, right? A three-dimensional S-curve. 
I actually had a wire representation of a three-dimensional S-curve. It looks like an S except it's bent three-dimensionally. A true polar uh, polarity vector is, of course, dimensional. Not only is from a null point in counter space, but it is also mutually divergent from one another, not merely, it can't be two-dimensional, it has to be three-dimensional. And because it is three-dimensional, if you actually extrapolate that in fullness, you will see that it paints out the inside, just imagine a donut, which is a toroidal shape. If you go from the null point in counter space and draw it out like this, you're actually drawing or tracing out the actual geometry of the donut or the toroidal shape and you actually extrapolate that in a 3D fashion since of course force and motion is denotatively uh, uh, magnitude and mass you will end up with of course the toroidal geometry of force and motion uh, that defines magnetism so what is polarity I and mean, people are using the word vortex Vortex only exists because everything is like a dog tied to a stake. Everything is always tethered in counter space. There are no straight lines in the universe of Mother Nature. Human beings draw straight lines on paper. And, you know, this is a straight line, the top of my iMac. We love straight lines, but there are no straight lines in nature. Everything in nature is curvilinear, and a force vector that defines polarity, the loss of energy, that defines further till further still in extrapolation polarity that defines force and motion that defines the toroidal geometry of magnetism is three-dimensional and the only way you can draw mother nature's force vector is a from counter space b like this that's merely two-dimensional but the third step of course that actually defines the polarity the the polarity vector of mother nature in its absolute simplex before we actually extrapolate out the toroidal which is in 360 degrees of each and every force vector is a three-dimensional s-curve let's repeat that twice again so that's perfectly clear a three-dimensional s-curve imagine drawing an s and then twisting it three-dimensionally so that each end is pointing in the opposite direction of the other so which would be like this yeah you can draw an s right here you go. You want to know what a three-dimensional S-curve looks like? Take a piece of wire, bend it in the perfect shape of an S, right? And then take each end of the S and bend it mutually apart, furthest apart from the other one, while still holding its S shape, right? Take a piece of wire, bend it into an S, and take each end and bend it away from the other end but while still maintaining its S shape. Yeah, this would be a true force, three-dimensional force vector of Mother Nature that paints out, I use the word paint, the conjugate nature of force of motion, inertia, and acceleration. That extrapolate, if you actually take that same S curve that you bent, you know, with each end apart from another, and did, say, 30 of those, and you stuck them together, you would notice like, wow, this paints out a donut. There's the uh, toroidal geometry of force and motion that defines magnetism. And magnetism, to say magnetism and to say create space and to say force and motion, it's all one and the same thing. There are no numbers in, uh, in natura naturans or mother nature. Mother nature does not have a calculator. Everything is force and motion, inertia and acceleration. Everything is capacitance, resistance, permeability and permittivity. Everything is either the release of energy or the return of that energy. That's why there's no straight lines in nature. That's the reason why there are so many vortexes in nature. Well, what's a vortex? Well, I don't know. I just like vortex. It's like when people talk about the golden ratio. You stump people every time. I've read every book there is on the golden ratio. Okay. And now define the golden ratio. Well, I don't know. It's like pretty, you know, like a nautilus. You can't get anybody to define it because they don't know what the hell it is. Like, uh, I mean, polarity, vortex, golden ratio. People will chirp these words endlessly and they haven't got a single clue in hell what the term polarity means. Nor a vortex, nor the golden... I've studied the golden ratio endlessly. I love those people. I was like, good. If you have, why don't you tell me what it... The only thing they've studied is like, look, this is the golden spiral. This follows the ratio of one to five. Yeah, that's nice, like a nautilus shell, and like this is a ratio of one to five. You haven't been studying what the golden ratio is. You've 
you study it's like studying someone's children without ever knowing the person that gave birth to them i know sally really well have you ever met sally no i never have but i met her children i know her children really well when people say they've studied the golden ratio they they haven't got a clue what the golden ratio is it's the same thing as the people that talk endlessly over and over again about polarity and vortexes. It's like, okay, you know, you know so much about polarity. Why don't you explain what the hell polarity means? I don't know. Well, good. Until you do, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Was that a bit too harsh? Not really. Not from where I'm sitting, it's not. Thank you so much for watching. That was a little harsh, was it? No, it wasn't harsh. It wasn't harsh at all, actually. <laughs> People think the universe is like this. You got physics here, and we got metaphysics here. And someone that has two ounces of wisdom is like, no, you don't have a tail here and a head here. You got one single effing metal that defines and makes up both. Like, oh, I'm worried about the head, and the other guy says, I'm worried about the tail. And the guy with wisdom says, I only give a shit about what the entire coin is made out of, because the coin defines the head and the tail. You know, ultimately, when you melt this shit down, you just got the metal. And where the hell is your head and your tail when you melt this damn thing down? It vanishes. That's the difference between an empiricist and a rationalist and a Western existentialist, they're debating the head and the coin, the head and the tail of a coin, not literally a coin, but of nature. And a true metaphysician, of which there aren't any more, except for me and like a handful of people, we don't care about this. We care about this the metal, the ultimate substance, the primordial foundation, the agathon. The Eudistos Dias that makes up the attribute of the Agathon. Yeah. And I, I don't know tell me about the golden ratio. It's like, until you can define the golden ratio, shut up. <laughs> uh, is that over the top? Maybe. Bye. Oh, yeah.